Hey kiddo, so today we are going to talk about the modern era of the 1920s. So from 1920 to 1929, this is known also as the Roaring Twenties, and it's going to start after World War I, after the United States has been victorious on the battlefield, the war is over, prosperity will return. Um, for most Americans, um, prosperity will like increase for some as well. Um, and really today what we're going to talk about is uh, like what's going on in the economy that makes it the roaring 20s, what's going on um, within society as well. There are a lot of changes that are taking place in the United States and around the world after World War I. Things are very different for Americans when it comes to consumerism and gender roles after World War I. Um, it's a major turning point and shift into something that looks a little bit more similar to how we kind of live our lives today um, versus the Victorian era. We have a lot more in common with um, the, the people that lived in the 1920s than we do with like the Victorian era, which was much more um, socially conservative, okay? So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing that we need to talk about before so that we have a greater understanding of why the 20s were roaring has a lot to do with the government and political policy. So the Republican Party is, we're still in this conservative Republican um, majority led like on the pendulum, right? This conservative swing um, that's really been kind of going on since the Civil War. Like we've had a couple examples of presidents and Congresses where it had some Democratic majority, but they never really held on for very long. When we think of the Republican Party of the early 1900s, Teddy Roosevelt was um, an important leader in, in the Republican Party. Um, he dies in 1919, and with that leadership, it's the Republican Party is really going to shift to an even more conservative view, kind of more similar with Taft and the Republicans of kind of the Gilded Age. Now, one thing that is different than the Republicans of the 1920s and that of the Gilded Age is that they're no longer preaching this laissez-faire economics because they've proven that that doesn't really work. When you have the monopolies and the trusts that take advantage of um, their wealth and their power and it limits competition, after the progressive era, the government and the people are no longer in support of that. So that's one part that's different, like especially after Teddy Roosevelt, a progressive Republican, where the Republican Party is, they're okay with um, kind of like doing away with laissez-faire, that hands-off approach. Um, but instead, they view that the role of government in regards to business should be to um, help it. Um, so it should be pro-business. Do whatever it is that you need to do in order for businesses and industries to thrive. Um, and it's it's very similar to almost like even like a trickle down theory that we would kind of that we know of today, which which more modern Republican Party adopts. The idea was that if um, the people at the top are doing well, they're going to stimulate the economy and that wealth will trickle down to all levels of America. Um, this is going to be the first real time that you see that type of economic approach. It is not going to be the last. Um, the Republican Party still has that type of view even today. The three Republican presidents that you need to know for the 1920s are going to be Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover. Um, and all three of them really kind of symbolize the idea the idea of the Republican Party as just kind of like, let's support business, we're not going to worry about anything else. Um, and so in Harding in particular, he didn't have his own legislative agenda that he wanted to push, where Teddy Roosevelt and Taft and Wilson, we just come off of this, you know, couple decades where the president really led and kind of used that bully pulpit and kind of helped guide legislation. Harding really wasn't that type of president. He let Congress do it um, and he just signed the laws that they passed. So um, playing into like that, um, you know, their platform, he reduced income tax, um, they raised tariffs. So again, remember, we've been talking about tariffs since the Federalist era. Um, the, the reason that they raised tariffs was that's a tax on an imported good so that Americans would continue to buy American goods. The tariffs will come into play 
um, a little bit later when we get to um, the great causes of the Great Depression. Um, what he's probably most known for is the Teapot Dome scandal. So his Secretary of State, or excuse me, his Secretary of the Interior, Albert Fall, um, was using his position to basically allow for oil companies to drill on federally owned land in and receive bribes. And so this was um, uh, investigation. It was in the press. And it really kind of put a stain on Harding's administration before he died in 1923. His successor is going to be Vice President um, Calvin Coolidge. And Silent Cal, as he was called, um, <clears throat> was really kind of this do little view. Um, some of my favorite quotes, because you know, they called him Silent Cal, I didn't really have a lot to say, but he said, if you don't say anything, you won't be called on to repeat it. Um, and my favorite quote that he used, uh, the business of America is business. Um, and so again, that's a really good quote to kind of sum up what the 1920s were. Um, <clears throat> in 1924, he is going to defeat kind of the progressives. Um, uh, John Davis was a Democrat from West Virginia um, because America, like business was good. And so if business was good. They're going to keep reelecting the Republican presidents and members of Congress. Um, Coolidge believed in limited government um, and again, on the side of the big businesses. His number one pr priority was reducing the budget. He was kind of conservative in that view. Um, he vetoed World War I veteran bonuses um, and a bill that would also help farmers because again, it's just his views were like, let's try to spend as few tax dollars as possible. And at the same time, let's try and help businesses as much as possible. Um, and that's really like all you need to know about Silent Cow. Um, in 1928, um, Herbert Hoover, who's played a role in other presidential administrations in the past, um, uh, he is going to win pretty decisively in 1928. Um, what's ironic about, and they say that he kind of rode the curtails of like Coolidge prosperity. Um, and we'll get more into that when we talk about causes of the Great Depression. Um, Ironically enough, in 1928, he actually gave a speech where he talked about how soon the United States would be able to end poverty um, as a whole. And I think what's important, because you guys know what's coming, right? You know that the stock market crash is going to happen in 29. You know that the depression is going to last and dominate throughout the 1930s. Um, and you know that Hoover, or you probably have a, this view of Hoover as kind of someone that didn't do much um, when the stock market did crash. It was a, the belief during this time period, because really you had Republican control, like, you know, since after the Civil War. Um, these conservative Republicans really did believe that um, that kind of hands off limited approach and promoting business, uh, rugged individualism, that that was the best policy. Um, you know, there have been times in the past where you have these peaks and troughs and like the business cycle. Um, and Republicans believe that was a natural part of it, but they still noticed that there was a growing trend in the economy. And so that's why they really believed in this viewpoint. Um, and you can see that the vast majority of Americans believe that the Republican Party was good for business, was good for America at this point in time in history. However, there was some mixed economic development. We'll talk more about this when we look at the Great Depression in the next chapter. Um, you have during the war, the economy did really well. Um, and then there was a slight recession. But after that, post-war, there's a period of business prosperity and growth. Um, and we know that it's also going to obviously end in uh, 1929. Um, unemployment was below 4%. The standard of living increased for the majority of Americans when you think about like electricity and running water. But again, we'll talk about the negative sides of that. Um, Real income from middle class and working classes had increased substantially compared to that of the Gilded Age, where you remember during the Gilded Age, um, the concentration of wealth was highly like concentrated towards the top. And so it's kind of evened out a little bit. 
Again, when we get to the causes of the Great Depression, I'll actually give you some more specific statistics on what it looked like. But for most Americans, it seemed like their paychecks were bigger um, and they were they had better working conditions. Um, they had more consumer goods to purchase because that was kind of a part of this period as well. Um, Forty percent of U.S. families had incomes, though, in the poverty range. So that just shows you how impoverished they were in the during that, that Gilded Age era, the progressive before the Progressive era, because at that point it was more like seventy percent were within that poverty range, and so it does shrink. But still, when you compare it to you know maybe today, um, there's still a lot of people living in poverty, so less than fifteen hundred dollars a year. So if you were to equate that, I think today the poverty level in America today is less than $18,000 or $20,000 a year. Um, what's really important is that farmers did not share in the boom of the 1920s at all. They were, um, it was actually much worse for them than it was during World War I. So first we're gonna look at causes for this business boom in particular, and then we'll talk about why things were so rough for the farmers after World War I. The first thing is um, increased productivity for factories. Um, you have the principle of scientific management. They're obviously using mass production. Those are things that have been used in the previous like industrial revolutions. However, in 1914, Henry Ford is going to perfect um, this system of mass production and the use of his factories um, with the moving assembly line. So the idea is that workers stay in one location instead of taking things and losing time by taking it to the next station. The car just, um, or people walking to the car, the car moves throughout the factory and the workers stay put. Um, this system, what he was able to accomplish in a 12 hour work day, they would make produce one car before the moving assembly line. And after the moving assembly line, they were putting out one completed car every 90 minutes. So why is that important? Let's use the car, for example, because this really is the decade of um, the automobile. It created culture. It became the number one focus of the economy. Um, and so why that's important is when you are able to produce a car quicker, right, more efficiently, that means that you can sell, it keeps your costs low for production. Um, that means that you can sell it for less money, which means that you can sell it to more Americans. And that's exactly what the Model T did. Um, in addition to increased productivity, you have energy technologies. So there's an increase of oil, electricity, coal is being used for railroads and to heat homes. Um, most of the factories at this point in time are going to be um, powered by oil, gasoline for the automobiles. By 1930, oil will account for 23% of all U.S. energy. Um, electric motors and factories, you have new appliances that are being used um, at home. So electrical generators increase 300% during the decade. So um, that's going to really promote and stimulate um, the economy because more people are going to buy things that because it's easy to, to get, get that energy and the electricity and whatnot. Um, and then I think something that's extremely important is understanding how government policy helps support and aid the growth of business. Um, of all levels of government, the 1920s favored um, pro-business policies. So there were corporate tax cuts. Um, they didn't enforce the antitrust laws. Uh, tax cuts for higher income Americans, um, which is going to account for like the imbalance in incomes, which is going to be one of the causes of the Great Depression. Um, the Federal Reserve set really low interest rates as well in order to um, uh, encourage people to borrow money. So for example, when you hear of um, a low interest rate, and this might be something that you hear adults talk about, um, and if you don't know what that means, like the Federal Reserve, like increase interest rates or lower them or whatever. So basically what that means is the rate at which you can borrow money. So let's say you want to buy a home or a car. When interest rates are really high, so like during rough times in our in, in history, you know, interest rates have been at like 20%. That means that if you borrow $10,000, you're going to pay 20% interest on that 10000 So it might discourage you from borrowing the money to buy a car or to buy a home because you don't want to pay that interest. You'd rather save the money. 
So the idea in lowering interest rates is that it encourages people to borrow money to buy the homes, to start the businesses, to buy cars and boats and go on trips and like all these things. Um, and so that's the, the idea behind keeping interest rates low. In addition to this time period, though, they relaxed a lot of the regulations on banks. Banks were kind of doing whatever they wanted to do, and that's going to create a major problem um, as we lead up to the Great Depression. So consumerism is an extremely important part of the 1920s. Because you have electricity in a lot of homes, that means that millions of Americans can buy these the latest and greatest appliances. Um, a lot of them are labor-saving devices, which we'll talk about when we talk about women a little bit later. Um, but refrigerators, vacuum cleaners, washing machines, um, the automobile becomes extremely affordable because of what Henry Ford was able to do and sells millions of them. So the average cost of a car was probably about three hundred dollars. Um, back then, I mean, that's, you know, it, it would be like, you know, a $10,000 car today. But again, if, because of um, easy monthly payments and installment buying and credit, um, it allowed for you to own all these things that you wanted, even though you might not have had cash in the bank. Um, and so that's also really important um, for the next chapter is that you could go to the department store and you could buy that dress on credit, or you could buy the appliance on credit, and it allowed for you to have anything and everything you ever wanted, even though you might not have had the money at that point in time to purchase it. By 1913, there are 1.2 million registered automobiles. 1929, 26.5 million. So on average, um, there was one car per family in America. Um, and just the the how quickly that happened. If you really think about before 1914, only wealthy people, it would be like the equivalent of people that have enough money to own a, um, like a private jet. Like those were the people that had automobiles. And within 15 years, average Americans were able to purchase it. What's really important about the car is that economically, the car is going to replace the railroad industry as the key promoter of economic growth. So where the railroad was steel and, you know, transport of goods and grains and mail and consumer goods and all of that, now other industries are going to benefit from more people buying more cars. So steel, glass, rubber, gasoline, um, there's going to be an increase in highway construction because remember a lot of these roads are either like old school um you know, like um, like brick or their dirt roads. And so a lot of cities and municipal governments and states are going to invest in construction industry um, in order to um, make it more likely that people will use their car and travel and promote more economic growth. In addition to that, Americans um, are going to go shopping and travel and commute to work and dating. The car is going to be seen as... Um, kind of like scandalous, especially when we talk about women a little bit later. Um, the fact that um, a man could pick up a woman in the car and they'd be in the car by themselves unchaperoned was something that was uh, very different than the Victorian era. So lots of different ways in which the car impacted um, the American economy and society. So now the poor farmers. It's hard being a farmer. Um, they are not going to share in the prosperity. The wartime years were really good for farmers because remember, um, there was an increased demand. So what they did during the war is they took out loans, they bought more land, they grew more wheat or corn. Um, they took out loans for these new tractors and uh, equipment in order to, um, uh, harvest things quicker because there were buyers and so they were trying to make money. Um, so the problem with that, in addition to that, there's um, uh, chemical fertilizers are used. So all of this is gonna help increase production. They're gonna be producing more during World War I than they had ever before. Um, it's gonna hurt the farmers because after the war is over, the demand is gone. And so farmers are now stuck with expensive equipment, they're extremely productive, so they're harvesting more grain. The, the demand is low, and so that's going to drive prices to all-time lows. 
Um, and so the 1920s are going to be very, very difficult for farmers in the United States. So we also talked about during um, the war that it was it was a good time for labor. They didn't really want uh, union membership increased, but because of the war, they wanted production to keep going. A lot of companies and the government kind of encouraged them to support, um, you know, an increase in um, wages and better working conditions and hours and things like that. Now, wages are going to rise during the 1920s. Um, but the labor movement's going to go backwards. So membership is going to decline. That might have something to do with the fact that they were paid better. So there wasn't really a need to, to join those labor unions. But a lot of companies are going to use an open shop system. So keeping jobs open to only non-union workers. So you would prove that you are a non-union worker um, and you would be hired. There's also this idea of welfare capitalism where companies were basically improving their benefits and higher wages in order to prevent them from being interested in a union. And I think that that's probably one of the most beneficial things of this time period and, and really how even today when you guys go off to look for jobs in the private sector one day, you want to look for companies that give you really good health care benefits and retirement packages and, you know, vacation and all of those things um, are stock options. Like those are things that recruit good workers to where they'll be happy, their morale is high, and they won't be interested in unionizing. Um, Henry Ford kind of had this idea, and he was one of the first ones, where he actually paid his workers a really decent wage. Like it was a, it was a good job to have. So why he did that, though, is a few reasons. One, he knew that he would recruit the best workers, right? And you could fire someone and someone would be willing to jump in and do that job because they wanted that high wage. So you could recruit better workers, more dedicated workers, if you pay them a higher wage. But in addition to that, if he's paying his workers more money where they have disposable income, where they can go out and spend more money, you know, in town or, you know, in buying a house and furnishing their home or whatever it might be, they're going to take that extra money and they're going to spend it in the economy, which is going to help those individual businesses, which means they have more money, which means they can buy more cars, right? Because everybody wanted one. And so that's how Henry Ford kind of justified paying your people a livable wage where if they have extra money, it'll actually stimulate the economy instead of the old way of thinking where it's like, let's keep costs down as low as, as much as possible where we can, you know, stuff our pockets with high profits. Now in the South, it's very different. Unions, um, working conditions are going to be very difficult in those factories. You know, we learned about new factories of the South, like textiles, tobacco, um, etc. So the South is going to view labor very differently. And that's why even today there are not a lot of companies that are pro-union, even like certain states where it's more common to see um, like teachers unions in northern states and in western states, that is not something that really exists in the South. And it's because of this history. Um, a lot of it also has to do with racial um, or racism, because one of the reasons it was so difficult to unionize in the South was because in order to do it efficiently, whites and blacks had to see themselves as equal so that they could demand equal pay and better working conditions. But because of that racism that exists, whites and blacks weren't really willing to unite on that. Um, so instead, a lot of companies um, like the Loray um, textile mills in Gastonia, which is, this, that's what this is an image of, um, the companies would use the police, they would use state militia in order to um, uh, keep down uh, unions, um, in particular, like some of them did turn violent. And so again, you're going to have people that just don't want any part of the union in the South. All right. The fun part is culture and new entertainment. So where newspapers had once been the only way for like mass communication and remember sensationalism of American imperialism and leading into World War I, now you have the invention of the radio. Extremely important event invention. Um, NBC or the National Broadcasting Company and CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting Station, um, allowed people to 
listen to the same programs across the country by 1927. So where before you would, in your local newspaper, you would only know about the sporting events like locally, um, or maybe a local business like advertising. Now what you have is people are listening to these quiz shows and comedies and you know the New York Yan Yankees playing um, the Cubs and you could listen to it in Pofftown, North Carolina or New York City or Hollywood, California, um, which is kind of cool. It was kind of uniting and it just blew people's minds that you would be able to do that. So the movie industry is going to be in Hollywood outside of or Los Angeles. Um, originally, it was called Hollywood Land, but that um, was going to lose. A they're going to take that away because it was just too much to talk about. Um, and going to the movies became part of the national um, like pastime. Um, it was happening in large cities and suburbs, small towns. You would have a theater and they would play one movie for, oh my gosh. I mean, I guess it depends. Like bigger cities, um, they might have more options. But like in smaller towns, like they would play maybe one movie for a month. And people would go and see that same movie probably over and over until the new one came out. Um, talkies were... The first talkie was in 1927. So before that, you had silent films um, because they didn't have the technology to have to record both like moving motion picture and sound. Um, by 1927, they figured out that technology to where you could um, watch the actors and hear them speak where before they would have like subtitles at the bottom. Um, and 80 million tickets were sold each week across the country. After World War I, there is going to be a huge shift in how Americans or who Americans viewed as role models. So before you had politicians like Teddy Roosevelt or Abraham Lincoln or maybe, um, you know, uh, Civil War veterans and generals and things like that. Um, during the 1920s, though, Americans and because of the radio, which played an important part of like creating this national culture where, again, people in New York or in California or Texas or North Carolina, they they were listening to the same sporting events and programs. But a lot of people looked up to these athletes, which, again, is kind of something similar to today. So Jack Dempsey was a famous um, boxer that they would listen to on the radio. Um, I think most people know the name Babe Ruth when it comes to home runs and baseball. Uh, golfer Bobby Jones was someone that a lot of people followed and looked up to. Um, non-athlete, a non-athlete was Charles Lindbergh, and he was a pilot who successfully flew from Long Island, so transatlantic, uh, to Paris. Um, and, and again, this shift is important because it really shows the impact that mass culture had um, on, on this era, but also it's going to set the tone for all the way up through today. So looking at women and gender roles, uh, something that's always really interesting, especially because we've been talking about women fighting for the right to vote for decades now, like almost a century. Um, the 19th Amendment was passed um, after World War I, again, mostly because of the role that women played in, obviously, the suffra suffragettes as a part of the progressive movement. But during World War I, you know, they stepped up, they worked in factories, they volunteered, they conserved food, they, you know, wrote letters to their, you know, to their sons, they did all of these things as patriots. And so after that, you know, people really couldn't argue any longer that women shouldn't have the right to vote. And so the 19th Amendment was passed and ratified. Now, what's interesting is during the 1920s, one of the things that they realized is that a lot of women um, ended up not voting much differently than their husbands or fathers. So instead of the women kind of becoming their own voting block and like swinging one way or swinging elections one way or the other, which today women are a voting block and they're, they're obviously divided up into different pieces of the pie. Um, but like moderate women today are a group that politically are targeted every single presidential election. Um, campaigns and candidates really look at what those moderate women want because they are kind of your swing voters from election to election. Um, back then, though, a lot of women kind of, they might have had their own opinion, um, but it just shows you that 
even though it's modern times, it didn't mean that women voted independently from their husbands or fathers. Um, most middle class women were expected to be homemakers and mothers, and that was for the most part, that's what it was like. Um, a lot of the consumer goods were targeted towards women. Um, and these are labor saving devices. Uh, routines are going to stay the same, like they're cleaning, but instead of sweeping, they're vacuuming. Um, in the labor force, so it's the same as it was kind of before the war. Um, they lived in cities. They were limited to clerks, nurses, teachers, uh, domestics, so like cooks or cleaning ladies, depending on like your... Um, so obviously you have like white collar jobs for women, um, which would be like secretaries and things like that and teachers. And then as you get kind of um, a little bit lower class or lower socioeconomics, they would work in pe wealthy people's homes as, uh, you know, cooks and cleaning ladies. Um, but no matter what, so they would be like male teachers and female teachers, even though they do the same job, they would be paid less than men. Um, there was also a moral revolution during the 1920s. So women now have the right to vote. Um, we're going to talk about fashion and all of that uh, momentarily. Um, but during this time, there was a psychologist called Sigmund Freud, and he wrote lots of things. I'm sure you've heard about Freud in maybe your psychology class. You could pro you probably know more than I do about him. But one thing in particular that really shaped the 1920s culturally um, is that he talked about how sexual repression was a sign of mental illness. Um, and some thought that premarital sex was an invention of kind of this modern age. So the idea was that you don't have to listen to um, these views that you can be more open with your sexuality. In addition to that, movies, novels, the car, again, remember, like you could go on unsupervised dates with a man, um, new dance steps, all of these things encourage promiscuity. That's what, at least what's more conservative people consider that. So the Charleston was a dance that was... Um, but instead of it being like really rigid, like Victorian era, like ballroom dancing, what you would think about the Charleston was much more like it involved you, you know, like flapping your legs up and, you know, opening your knees and all of these things that um, a lot of more conservative people saw as um, morally questionable. In addition to that, um, women like Margaret Sanger, who had really argued for um, reproductive health and education for women so that she would basically teach them, you know, ways to um, like family planning. Contraceptives are illegal. Um, you could still kind of get your hands on them. And we're talking, you know, we're not talking about like the pill or anything quite like that yet other ways, but even certain um, strategies that have been used for years in order to give women more control over their life so that if they're not ready to have a child or if they're if they don't want six kids because that's six mouths to feed women like margaret sanger and and people that were in favor of contraceptives that those things were out there and again that worried conservatives now, divorce is going to be more and more common, um, especially during the 1920s. Um, they could escape abusive relationships or just like for any reason, women could divorce their husbands. By 1930, one in eight marriages ended in divorce. Um, and that was something that before, like during the Victorian era, just wasn't possible. And it shows you that women had more options, too. So, for example, one of the reasons that you wouldn't ever divorce a husband, even if you couldn't legally do it, uh, even if you could legally do it, in the 1800s, what would you do? <laughs> um, you couldn't maybe own property, you couldn't buy your own farm or live that way. Um, but now as women are living in the cities and there are occupations and there are livable wages for them, they could do that. Um, I So my grandmother's parents were divorced because her father was an alcoholic and it was an abusive relationship. And so it was around the same time period where um, uh, her parents got divorced, um, and it was something that was more and more common if you were in one of those abusive relationships. Fashion. All right, so this is a flapper. You've probably heard of them before. This modern woman, this view, it was influenced by the movie stars, so again, more mass culture. And 
it's so different from the Victorian era because um, well, everything. The hemline is up. It shows your ankles. Uh, not as far as your knees, though. I mean, you would see your knees if you were dancing, like doing the Charleston. Um, the traditional Victorian dresses, like, went all the way down to your wrist. And obviously, you can see here that most of the dresses and styles were sleeveless. Um, the Victorian era, women had very long hair, and it was always, like, put up in a really, like, modest, like, bun or updo. Now women are cutting their hair short. Um, they're wearing makeup. Um, they would be, it's what's called a bob. Um, in public, they would be seen smoking cigarettes and drinking alcohol, kissing more than one man, right? So before, like, I mean, there were women that it was, it was not, I'm sure it, I mean, of course it happened, but it would have been unladylike for you to kiss a boyfriend or a suitor until you were at least engaged. It would have been very scandalous. But now women are doing these things in public. They're driving cars like, oh, it's just super scandalous. But that was this flapper culture, this modern woman. Um, and it's a huge shift from the Victorian era. Like it's a drastic change. It's not something that like over, you know, over time got more and more. It was a really huge jump from the Victorian era fashion to this flapper fashion. And a lot of it symbolized the changing economy and culture of the United States as well. So quickly, we're going to talk about um, the arts. So post-war authors were known as the lost generation. You probably read about them in English class. F. Scott Fitzgerald, who wrote The Great Gatsby, which is about the Roaring Twenties. Hemingway, Sinclair Lewis. Um, T.S. Eliot is also famous. Lots of famous playwrights. Um, and one of the things that the lost generation talked about was this disillusionment of the ideals of an earlier time and then really focused on materialism of the day. Um, so they were upset with how Americans were prioritizing um, consumerism and like keeping up with the Joneses, like that was a phrase. Um, a popular architectural style, it was more than architectural, but it's Art Deco. It really encompasses the 1920s. I have a piece of Art Deco jewelry. It can be in jewelry. It was actually appliances were Art Deco. Hopefully in class, I'll get to talk to you guys about that a little bit. Um, but architecture, it was the most common way. Um, so if you look at this building behind me, I don't know if this cityscape looks familiar to anyone, but this is Winston-Salem. Um, in the late 19 teens, early 1920s. And the building that you see right behind me is the RJ Reynolds Tobacco Building. This is an Art Deco style, and it was actually the, the same architect that designed the Empire State Building in New York City. Um, and so it's currently, it used to be the RJ Reynolds Tobacco like headquarters. Um, today it is uh, the Cardinal Kempton Hotel. But if you look over, so, oh, like, I don't know how this is going to work. Sorry. Um, let me see if I can do this. <laughs> right here, this is the Empire State Building. This is the lobby to the Empire State Building. So Art Deco is a lot of gold, a lot, it's like angular, um, a lot of stone and gilding. Um, and so what's interesting here, so you can see this is the lobby of the Empire State Building. It has like what looks like a lot of geometric shapes and figures um, in Art Deco style. Um, and it almost looks like um, like factory like wheels or whatever, but it's, it's pretty and it's decorative. This is the lobby of the R.J. Reynolds Building. And it's a smaller, it's a smaller version of it. Um, so, because it was built before the Empire State Building. But if you go in the building, one of the things, so like in the floors and on the sides and like in the elevators, even right here, you can see that with the brass, um, these are actually tobacco leaves, right? So it kind of pays homage to the industry itself. And I think that that's what he was also trying to do here with the Empire State Building with like manufacturing and um, kind of like in industry because um, the Empire State Building is going to serve as like a bunch of different office buildings. Um, but I always like to share that part of local history with Art Deco architecture. <laughs> 
One of the most important effects of World War I um, on the makeup of the United States is going to be the Great Migration, which we talked about in the last lecture. Uh, the Great Migration was when African Americans, for really the first time in American history, had the opportunity, to, economic opportunity, to escape the discrimination, um, the terrorism um, in the South. And so when those factory owners went south with those train tickets, it gave them the opportunity to escape cyclical poverty, um, indebtedness from the sharecropping system. And one of the things that's also really interesting is during this time, a lot of Southern whites were worried that this was going to happen. And so for most of like the early 20th century, they attempted by intimidating them from even like leaving their farms in different ways. Um, and so now, and so like a lot of these men that were given these tickets, they had to like sneak around and, and, you know, not tell anyone and just all, like pretty much disappear. Um, but eventually they do, they move into cities like Chicago and Detroit, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, um, and they bring with them their families and they establish these communities. So by 1930, 20% of African-Americans lived in the North. Um, if you were to go back to like 1900, it would be something like 95% of African Americans lived in the South. Um, when they got there, there is still a ton of discrimination in housing and in jobs. Um, they clustered in different communities, much like how the immigrants, the new immigrants did in cities that we studied uh, in a couple chapters ago. Um, and they were limited in where they could live. So there are um, things called redlining where, you know, certain city zoning where they would draw where African-Americans weren't allowed to live in certain neighborhoods or on certain streets if it had a certain percentage of white homeowners on those streets. Um, banks wouldn't loan them money, things like that. Um, jobs, they did make less than white their white counterparts for the same work. However, African-Americans were making more money in the North than in the South as a sharecropper or tenant farmer or any type of labor. Um, and the standard of living was higher. So the largest concentration of African-Americans um, within a community is going to be in Harlem, New York, which is a borough of New York City, um, about 200,000 by 1930. And it was famous because of the, the writers and the artists um, and the musicians that came out of Harlem. Um, most popular is going to be Langston Hughes and Claude McKay. And so some of the things that they wrote about were really inspiring for African Americans. So one, some of the, the things that they wrote about were about the frustrations and just the hardships of being a Black American, um, which a lot of, obviously, their readers understood and could, um, could identify with. But I think what's also really important is that they talked about oh, there's a lot of pride and a lot of joy and a lot of a lot about their culture and their heritage that they should be proud of. Because remember, in the South, like from as early as, you know, the first enslaved people were brought to the shores, there really was this goal of um demoralizing and teaching like white superiority and that they are inferior and they're not worthy. Um and so if you're looking at that generation after generation for you know 200 years or more, there is it had an effect on this group of people that were living in the South. Well, now they're in the North and they're living in these cities and they're finding some financial success in there. They have these authors that are inspiring them, and it, it really does promote the ideas of equality. And I think that the Harlem Renaissance, you can make connections to its proximity to after World War II and the, the civil rights movement starting really in the 1950s, early 1940s. W.B. Du Bois, remember him um, as one of the progressive reformers? He's been talking about these radical ideas of equality for a while now. But now that they're in these concentrated areas where they can um, support one another and they can see that they're thriving, um, or thriving more than they were, and to kind of be hopeful towards the future was really important in what these writers did. In addition to that, you have um, jazz music. So most of jazz musicians of this period were African American. Jazz is something that is uniquely American. Um, so where other music has different kind of influences from other parts of the world, 
jazz music is something that originated here in the United States. Um, Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong were really popular, not only with African Americans, but what's really interesting about this time period is now a lot of white Americans were listening to this traditionally like black form of music um, and they were in high demand. Like you, you would want to go to a club where Duke Ellington was playing or Louis Armstrong or Bessie Smith. Um, what's interesting is that most of these musicians are playing in segregated clubs. They can't even eat or drink in that restaurant or nightclub, um, you know, in a normal situation, but yet they're good enough to play music and entertain them. That is something that if you think about like as a continuity from the days of, um, you know, slaves dancing in Charleston market for um, as a source of entertainment, you have the menstrual shows as well. Um, and then even if you like fast forward to, you know, the 1980s and hip hop music and R&B um, or more recently with, um, you know, Oscar's so white, which is this view that, you know, African Americans are disproportionately hosting events such as the Oscars, but they're not getting the nominations for directors and, um, you know, best actress and things like that. Um, and so that, that is something that a lot of people have looked at as, as whites have kind of accepted African Americans as a part of our overall like culture, and especially in the arts. Um, the music and the, you know, them entertaining white people is acceptable, but then like giving them awards and accolades isn't quite caught up yet. And so that's an interesting uh, continuity. That is some complex <laughs> thinking about the situation, but um, that is something that has been historically that you could, you could argue. So Marcus Garvey is a, um, what we would call like a black nationalists. There's this rise in nationalism. Um, and he is probably the earliest example of that. He was more radical than Du Bois. He, he believed in equality, um, but his radical idea was uh, whites aren't going to ever accept us. So he supported an organization of like, or black separatism economic self-sufficiency, and even a back to Africa movement. So it's interesting because in the past, like during the um, early reform era, we talked about how there were white abolitionists that were organizing like Liberia, for example, as a back to Africa movement, but it was whites telling black, free black Americans, like you need to go to Africa. Um, <clears throat> now we have um, an African-American man who is a Jamaican immigrant. So he also in Jamaica had obviously uh, the black population in Jamaica had were the descendants of slaves. Um, and so his view was let's organize this to the point where African-Americans that are being discriminated against in the United States, if we could go to Africa. Um, now, obviously these people that um, most of these African Americans, when it says back to Africa, they were born in the United States, and um, by this point, probably you know either born into freedom or some possibly born into slavery. Um, but that was his view, and so for him, though his his popularity kind of declined um, after the steamship. So the Black Star was what was going to like take people to Africa. And he was arrested um, of charges of fraud. He was convicted, jailed, deported back to Jamaica. And so it kind of declined. Most African-Americans and their leaders disagreed with Garvey and his approach. Um, however, his ideas weren't so radical. If you fast forward to the civil rights movement, the late 1960s, early 1970s, where you have a new black nationalist movement, the black pride movement. Um, where there was kind of this idea of separatism. Um, and so he was, again, and that's something that we've talked about as well, is like there are people that seem really radical for their time period, but if you look at how they inspire, you know, a few decades later, a new movement, Marcus Garvey um, would fall into that category. So one of the things that hopefully you're realizing with the 1920s is um, that in cities, life is, is very different than what we've talked about in previous chapters. Um, and as there's been a greater rural 
to urban migration with industrialization, there's also been a really big difference between how rural people live their life and how um, people in cities live their life, especially during the 1920s. And this is reflected also in the modernist versus fundamentalist movement. So in the Protestant faith, so you have Christians, right? You have Catholics, and then you have the Protestant faith. So we've talked about how Protestants have discriminated against Catholics and like Eastern Orthodox and groups like that. But now there's going to be division within this Protestant um, denomination. And it has a lot to do with the traditional values that was found in rural areas in the South and of the modernizing views of people living in cities. So for example, a modernist, and again, there's like range, like how you became more modern. So I think, I think progressive when I think of these modernists, um, you know, the social gospel, scientific knowledge, a lot of women, these things are changing. They're, they're changing their minds on these certain topics. So women like the flappers, for example, are going to not be as conservative. They're more open to scientific knowledge. Um, I think that one of the, the most important things in understanding what someone who's a modernist <clears throat> is they're still Protestant. They're still Christian. They still go to church. However, they are just not as radical. So, for example, the historical and critical view of certain passages of the Bible and also accepting Darwin's theory of evolution. So you can believe in science and your religion, your Christian religion at the same time. That's kind of the view. It's the same thing of like with dinosaurs, right? We know scientifically that dinosaurs roamed the earth however many billion years ago. Um, but how does that play into the Bible and the story of creation? Like, where does that fall into place with the Bible? Modernists would say, well, how do we, maybe we need to interpret, you know, on day one, you know, God created the heaven and the earth and day two, we need to, we need to interpret that different. He didn't mean it literally, or the Bible doesn't mean it literally. It just means like this was the process. Um, that would be a modernist view. Whereas fundamentalists who are mostly in rural areas, it started with the Protestant preachers. Um, they begin teaching, um, you know, from the pulpit that no, like if it says this in the Bible, it's literal interpretation. Um, the story of the, like, again, with the creation story, like, no, like they were, it was this day and like, and then dinosaurs, uh, you know, those, those are animals. So they exist at the same time as humans. Um, and, and that's what the Bible says. And that's how it goes. Whereas scientists are like, but no, like, that's like not possible. Okay. So that's the difference between the two. Um, they're going to condemn modern. So they're going to see them as the enemy. Um, they said that, you know, it's kind of like a slippery slope. So that's this image behind me is, is really important where at the top of the step, it's like, oh, here's Christianity. Um, and then like, as you take some steps down, you start believing new things like, oh, man's not made in God's image. Okay. Yeah. I accept that. Like, oh, there's no miracles. Yeah, that's fine. And then you keep going on to where it's like, there's no God, there's no atonement, no resurrection. So, which basically means like, you don't believe in Christianity. Um, and then like being an ag um, agnostic um, to straight up like atheism. And so they say that like, if you accept these small things, um, as not being true to the doctrine, then eventually you will fall into atheism. And again, that's the fundamentalist view. And so with that, and we've talked about religion since the very beginning and with the great awakening in the 1700s, and then, you know, the second great awakening, Revivals have played a really important role in spreading information, um, religious information to Americans. And what's now interesting is how technology is going to impact that. So there are revivals, but now you have radio evangelicals like Billy Sunday and Amy Simple McPherson, where they get on the radio station and they have their little church service or their revival or whatever it is. And you're talking about, you know, tens of thousands of people, if not closer to 100,000 people um, listening in and, you know, believing what they're saying. Um, 
they attacked, you know, drinking. So a lot of Southerners and a lot of uh, rural people are going to be in favor of prohibition and gambling, dancing. So like the Charleston we talked about, like it's, you know, it, it makes people question their morals. Um, and Amy Simple McPherson was really interesting. She called the twin evils jazz music and communism. Um, so yeah, there's even that, like there's a political uh, force as well. So uh, politics started getting involved and twisted from, in, in these churches and from the pulpits where they're giving their views on, um, on politics as well. Now, probably the most famous example of um, this clash between modernism and fundamentalism is going to happen with the Scopes trial. So most Southern states have outlawed the teaching of Darwin's theory of evolution. Like it's not in biology class. Um, and I'll be honest, when I was in ninth grade and I took biology um, in a suburban area, my teacher was older. She could have probably been retired for like 10 years when, so she was probably like 65 years old. Um, she was probably born around the 1920s. Um, and she did not teach the word Darwin never came out of her mouth. It was, I don't even think it was in our textbook to be completely honest with you. Um, now I do think that there were other teachers in North Carolina teaching it, but I don't think she did. Um, Anyway, so the ACLU, which you've probably heard of that before, the American Civil Liberties Union, this is a group of people that, uh, of lawyers, who their goal is to create, um, uh, through litigation, demand civil liberties. So think of like the NAACP with like civil rights. They wanted to find examples of people that had, where their civil liberties had been limited get them arrested so that they have a charge and then use the courts to set a precedent that would protect more people's civil liberties. And the same thing happened with the NAACP. Um, and that's really when you think about like how the courts are used today um, on like constitutional issues, like they are looking for plaintiffs um, that have been arrested for an issue or, did, or some type of, um, you know, been harmed in some sort of way so that they could try to work it up through the court system so the Supreme Court will make a decision. And this mostly on controversial things. Um, and we'll talk about that in class. But so the ACLU persuaded a biology teacher named John Scopes in Tennessee to teach uh, Darwin's theory of evolution to his high school biology class. And so he does so. He is arrested in 1925, and now the ACLU is going to represent him in the case. So his attorney is a guy by the name of Clarence Darrow, and it was all over the news. It's in the newspapers, it's on the radio. Like everyone was really interested in this. And you really start to see this urban rural divide where like people in cities are like, are you kidding me? They're not teaching evolution. And really conservative, like rural areas are like, those, those people, they're coming after us. They're coming after our schools. They're trying to brainwash our kids. And that was a real thought. Um, now, representing the fundamentalists was William Jennings Bryan. Okay. Um, he was very religious. He was a Democrat. Remember, he's a progressive. Um, but he, again, he, he actually testified in the trial as a biblical expert. So that just shows you his view. Um, in the end, Scopes is convicted. Um, it will later be overturned on technicality, but the reason that this is important is because it's kind of, sh it's, it's an example of how this division is going to exist. Um, and a lot of these laws are gonna continue to exist, but not really maybe as enforced as much because the last thing you want is your school to be connected to a trial like this. Um, and so maybe principals kind of turn a blind eye or parents, you know, don't worry about it. Or teachers just say, just do what they're supposed to do. But this is a, was a really important, um, it was, I guess, a, a trial that because it was on the radio, like everyone knew about it. Um, and again, kind of reflects this time period of the division between the rural urban divide. In addition to um, religion, or I guess, within society, uh, you have prohibition. Now remember, we've been talking about temperance for a while. It started as a religious thing, as a, a, an effect of the Second Great Awakening. Finally, the 18th Amendment um, 
will be passed by Congress during World War I, and that is mostly due to the fact that we're rationing and conserving wheat and barley and things like that. Um, and so it didn't make sense to be making alcohol out of it. In addition to that, have this sober workforce. So something that a lot of those industrialists of the Gilded Age were in support of. So in 1919, the Volstead Act is the federal law that's going to enforce it. Um, however, prohibition was probably um, the least effective piece of legislation that the federal government has ever passed. That's not true, but I mean, it was. Um, it didn't stop people from drinking alcohol. It actually, in, it was a way, especially in cities, it almost like was a way to defy, it, it was fashionable to like go to a speakeasy and be caught drinking. Like it was, it was a cool thing to do. And so it, it was, it did the exact opposite of what it was supposed to do. Um, people continued to drink. Meanwhile, um, you know, states and the federal government are losing out on all that tax revenue. Um, and they're paying more money for the police officers to enforce the law. Um, and, you know, then you have people in jail for it. And then that costs money for the state. So it was extremely expensive. Um, it was an extremely expensive piece of legislation. Bootleggers were people that smuggled alcohol from Canada or they made it in their basements or like as what we're probably more familiar with here in North Carolina, um, you know, they would, you know, have their stills in the in the mountains in these rural areas and they would make it there and sell it. Um, prohibition is going to also increase organized crime. So because it's it shifts it to the black market. It allows for people like Al Capone to completely control it. And it's also tax free. Um, so he's going to make millions. Um, it allowed for gangs to grow larger. It, it, a lot of violence happened, um, increase in prostitution, gambling, drug use, all of that. Like once you dip your toe in illegal activities, um, such as a gang, it kind of expanded from there. Now, Republicans are going to support it, just like how they supported it in the past. It's, they called it a noble experiment. Democrats are going to be divided. Southern Democrats are in favor of it because that's more conservative uh, group where Democrats in northern cities um, were against it. Right. So you have like the Irish and kind of like the immigrant groups and then just like modernists in general, the people that liked the partying and the, of the roaring 20s. So a really big issue during this time also is going to be uh, a rise in nativism. So over a million immigrants are going to enter the United States um, between 1919 and 1921. Um, like that of the pre-war period, most of these people are Catholics, Jews. They're from Eastern and Southern Europe, kind of those new immigrants that we talked about. And so this is going to have an effect on the rise of nativism. The Red Scare is going to play a role in that as well. Um, workers are worried about competition for jobs. And then there's also this fear of communism and foreign radicals, this idea of revolution and anarchists. Um, so in 1921, they passed the first quota act and this limited immigration to 3% of the number of foreign born persons from any given nation in the 1910 census. So in 1910, if they said that, you know, um, Three or 30,000 Croatians immigrated here. That would be a lot, by the way. Um, then you would take 3% of that, and that's the number that they would allow in from Croatia after 1921. Okay. Well, apparently that didn't do enough because in 1924, they passed another one. They said 2% based on the 1890. Um, Arrival. So you had to have arrived before 1890, whatever or whatever that number was in 1890. So it takes out a lot of those new immigrants, um, and so it limited them even more. Because uh, again, they're trying to limit immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe. So they had quotas for all European and Asian nationalities. Interestingly enough, uh, it's so no restriction on Canadians or Mexicans. So about half a million Mexicans are going to migrate into the Southwest in the 1920s. And most of this had to do with the fact that um, Mexican migrants were extremely important for the agricultural labor uh, in those regions. And so they were actually seen as an economic uh, necessity that they needed that work and they needed that labor. <laughs> 
we've talked about Sacco and Vanzetti um, before, like during World War I. Um, but just a reminder that they were, this is an example of the, the growing nativism during this time period. So these were men that were charged and executed for a crime in which there was no actual physical evidence that connected them. But more so because that they were known as these agitators, um, that they were people that just shows how much they disliked Italians. There was a lot of discrimination towards these groups of people. And then also um, the fact that they were anarchists, like there was a lot of bias um, in their trial. And, and again, they were executed in 1927. So it's a really good example of, um, as evidence of Americans were very anti-immigrant at this point in time. And we're going to end today um, with kind of probably the most uh, crazy part of the 1920s was you have this increase in nativism, but it's also going to, and that's going to lead to um, a resurgence in the Ku Klux Klan. So by 1915, the KKK um, was just as strong. Its membership was just as high in the Midwest as it was in the South. And they were very active as well in the Midwest. So we're talking about, you know, Ohio and Illinois and Minnesota, Wisconsin. Um, and this is important for today because one of the things that I think a lot of Southerners don't understand is, you know, unfortunately, it, it, it's becoming more common actually in more recent years, but it's not uncommon to drive through a rural part of the state or the rural, a rural part of the South on the highway and to see um, a Confederate flag flying. Um, but I think a lot of Southerners would be surprised if you drive through Ohio and Indiana and Wisconsin that there are still people that have the Confederate flag in those areas. Um, and a lot of it dates back to this point in time. So Woodrow Wilson uh, showed a, the first film in the White House called Birth of a Nation. I've mentioned it in a previous lecture. And it really portrayed Reconstruction and the KKK as these heroes. Um, there was a lot of white backlash in response to the Great Migration. Um, there were uh, riots in 1919 in Chicago. Um, and it was an easy way for whites in the North to kind of pick a scapegoat towards African Americans, but in addition to a lot of the immigrants that were coming over. So the KKK kind of expanded, not just like white supremacy um, towards African Americans, but white supremacy and almost like a sense in this white nationalism, it kind of expanded. So it was anti-immigrant, there's a lot of xenophobia, um, suspected communists. So anyone that um, was kind of like radical or more progressive in their views. Um, and you can really like look, if you look at where these more conservative areas and, um, you know, white nationalist groups and Proud Boys and things like that, it's not Southerners that are these white supremacists. They're located all over the country. And that is conclusive with when you look at this time period and you would look at where the there was a spike in KKK membership, like Oregon, for example, had like the highest percentage. It was like something like 30 percent of the state were members of the KKK in Oregon. Um, and again, a lot of it has to do with this white nationalism and white supremacy, not just towards African-Americans, um, I mean, they were discriminatory towards African-Americans, but other groups as well. So it really expanded. Um, and obviously we will see how these groups are going to treat the civil rights movement um, in the coming decades. Um, so that is it for the 1920s, though. We are going to, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about, so a lot of this the last part of this lecture is about the social uh, interactions between Americans. Starting with the next lecture, which we're going to talk about the Great Depression, I'm going to talk review some of the economic policies that kind of got us to the stock market crash and got us to the Great Depression. So we'll kind of review a little bit of the 1920s in that video as well. Okay, I hope you learned something and I'll see you next time. Bye.